The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. Welcome to the Stoa. I am Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa, and the Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And today we have a very special guest, Derek Jensen. Uh, Derek, at least according to his uh, Wikipedia bio, is a, a radical environmentalist and an anti-civilization advocate. Uh, Democracy Now! Uh, labeled him a poet philosopher of the ecology movement. Um, he's the author of many books, uh, and I have all of them, uh, A Language Over the World, uh, The Culture of Make-Believe, what else do we got here, Endgame, and then What We Leave Behind. Uh, and how Derek came on my radar, I think I was like 17, uh, just got out of high school, was going to university, and I read A Language Over the World, uh, Words, and it uh, blew my mind, just opened me up to a different world, and it kind of opened me up to an intellectually rich life. Uh, and, and kind of show the seriousness of the situation we're in. So, um, and I mean, him corresponded on an email back, and this is back in 2003 as well, and he gave me some advice on, on writing and stuff, so I, I appreciate that. Um, so how today's gonna work is uh, Derek and I are gonna chat for about 10, 20 minutes. If you have any questions throughout, throw them in the chats. Uh, I will call on you to unmute yourself. If you don't want to be uh, on YouTube, because this will eventually go on YouTube, just indicate that in the chats. Um, be respectful, uh, one follow-up question uh, only. And if um, you know if people are kind of unmuting themselves and it turns into a shit show, then I'll take away the unmuting access from everyone. Um, that being said, I will allow Derek to unmute himself. Uh, welcome to the, the Stoic, Derek. Thank you for having me. And thank you everybody for showing up. And, and Derek's on a, like an old computer right now. So it's like, uh, it's a lot of noise are coming from it. So opportunity for us to practice our stoicism as always. Um, so the title of this talk uh, is a quote I got from someone speaking about your career, I believe. And they said this, um, at some point in his career, everyone, everyone who loves Derek Jensen's work is gonna hate him because he refuses to follow any ideological lines and takes his thoughts wherever they go. Um, so I guess the, the launching question is why do you think this individual said this about you and what it is, what is it about like how you operate intellectually that makes this the case? Well, one of, thank you for asking that. And one of my intellectual heroes is Lewis Mumford. Uh, and Lewis Mumford was a very strong pro technology, uh, advocate in the 1930s. And then along came World War II, and that profoundly changed his perspective. Uh, before World War II, he believed the notion that who controls the technology makes the difference in how it is, in whether the technology is helpful or harmful to society. And he saw World War II and realized he'd been wrong. And I think it takes great intellectual courage to admit you're wrong and to go, to go, um, to go wherever the facts lead you. And um, I'm not saying that I have the intellectual courage of Lewis Mumford. I just know that um, that, that there have been times in my books where I have written something. And a great example is, uh, in dreams, I think it was, I was really taking Richard Dawkins to task and saying some frankly pretty bad things about Richard Dawkins. And then I said some worse things about Richard Dawkins. And um, I hope they hang up quickly. Anyway, I said some worse things about Richard Dawkins, but then I came across new information about him that made it so that was uh, what I was saying was wrong. So it's like, I got to pull that. And if you're going to write a book, you should tell the truth. And if you're going to, um, good. Um, if you're going to, I, I don't understand. And it, it makes me very frustrated when people 
uh, deny truths, whatever they are, deny, deny new evidence to, to, to fit a preconceived perspective. Um, I'm thinking of the fact I was raised a fundamentalist Christian and, you know, there were very, there was dogma that was sometimes more important than, than, than reality. And I sort of made my bones in the late eighties, early nineties as an environmentalist. And uh, during the late 80s and early 90s, one of the big things in the Pacific Northwest was uh, the owls versus jobs debate. And I was pretty stunned by the uh, dishonesty of it because all through the 80s, the cut went up and the number of jobs went down. And it, it wasn't protecting spotted owls that was costing the jobs, it was raw log exports and automation, but people wouldn't talk about that. And, and I guess I wanna back up just a little bit. And I guess one of the reasons I'm rambling apart from the fact that that's what I do is that, um, is that nobody's ever asked me this particular question so far. And the, maybe one of the reasons I do this is I remember when I was in college, um, I first gained some disdain for mainstream media because it, me, mainstream media people, mainstream news people, because it seemed like almost every time they wrote about something that I knew, apart from sports, if they wrote about something political I knew something about, um, they, they had their facts wrong. And I have sort of a terror of writing something and then it ending up that sort of like, uh, I think it was Emily Littell in the 1970s on Saturday Night Live, you know, never mind because I was, I got my facts wrong. So I have a real terror of that. So I try to make the arguments as sound as I can and then go from there. I don't know if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. It does. I mean, some of it's not really a political act. Some of it is just, I try to be careful. And, um, and I have great disdain for those who, uh, who will intentionally like spin things in order to serve their agenda as opposed to getting the facts first and then figuring out where they go. And, it, and, and I have disdain for myself when I do that too. You know, I just finished yesterday, I finished writing a draft of a book about how marijuana legalization has been and is sort of a great transfer of wealth from family farmers to big speculators. And um, it was tempting in this, as I'm saying, you know, how, how great the family farmers of marijuana were, it was really tempting to ignore the fact that a lot of underground farmers use illegal pesticides, do some really nasty stuff, steal from each other. So it was really tempting, to, not really tempting, it was slightly tempting to ignore those to better make my case. But you know what? Gotta show our warts too. And here's one more thing and then I'll shut up. But I think part of it comes too from, I would rather find my own flaws in my own arguments and I would rather point those out beforehand rather than have somebody else point it out to me later. That was a preemptive strike. Of, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I see a lot of uh, STOA regulars here, and I don't know what their familiarity is with your work. So I wonder if there's like a, a 101 on Derek Jensen, his worldview, that you can provide us, and then we can kind of dig deeper from there. Um, yeah. First one is, I, if I had to sum up all my books into, I think, one sentence, it would be, uh, this way of living will not last. And when it's over, I would rather that there is more of the world left, left rather than less. So that's pretty much it. Um, another one is physical reality is always more important than what we think about it. 
And what we think about it can certainly influence how we behave in, in it, but physical reality is always primary. So we can call Warehouse or the tree growing company, but that doesn't make them the tree growing company. And um, we can call wind and solar green, but that doesn't make them green. And, and in fact, that's another thing is, you know, I was really heavily influenced by um, one of the most important interviews I ever did was with uh, Robert J. Lifton. And he wrote The Nazi Doctors and many other books, one of the world's foremost, if not the world's foremost authority on the psychology of genocide. And one of the things he talks about extensively <coughs> that really influenced me a lot was uh, the idea that before you can commit any mass atrocity, you have to convince both yourself and others that what you're doing is not an atrocity, but instead good, virtuous. So according to the Nazis, the Nazis were not, in fact, committing mass murder and genocide, but they were purifying the Aryan race. They weren't waging aggressive war. They were uh, gaining Lebensraum. And this is true on a personal level, too, that I don't know if I'm the only person here who has never once in my life been a jerk. I mean, every time that I have objectively been a jerk, I've had myself fully convinced that I was acting righteously and the other person deserved whatever I did to them. Um, in other words, we can rationalize almost any behavior, which is one of the reasons I'm way more interested in reality. Yeah, no, no, I'm interested in the rationalizations, but I recognize that rationalizations, including my own, are just rationalizations, and we always have to come back to ground. We always have to come back to what is. So, in sum, this way of living can't last, won't last, and after it's done, I'd rather that more of the world be left rather than less. Uh, another part is, uh, um, I don't believe that humans are particularly special. I mean, I, I believe that humans are special, but I think the bears are equally special. I think tr redwood trees are equally special. I, I don't think we are better than anybody else, more deserving than anybody else. I don't think we're particularly more intelligent than anybody else. I think that there are an infinite number of, no, it's not an infinite number. There's, there's a, a huge range of vastly different intelligences that we cannot, uh, that we literally can't conceptualize. And we can't conceptualize what it's like to be a dog uh, with a sense of smell that is more important than a sense of vision. And anyway, so non-humans are more important than we give them credit for. And also, uh, larger communities are more important than individuals, such that um, I love Paul Stamets' line about nature loves a community, um, that I'm not sure that nature loves every individual, because lots of little tadpoles get eaten before they turn into frogs. and. Um, as an individual, things can be, get pretty tough, but, uh, but the, the, the communities are more important than, than individuals, um, which can have some interesting toxic mimics in society where we come to believe that Coca-Cola is the corporation is more important than individuals. That's not what I'm talking about. Anyway, I'm rambling again. So if there's anything people want to chew off on any of that, that'd be great. Um, so start uh, throwing your questions in the, the chat. I'll, I'll call on you in a moment. Um, I, I saw in a video that's, you know, summarized my work video. You also said another one, uh, uh, perpetrators of abuse are insatiable. Oh yeah, that's, yeah, that's had a really, you know, I like Chris Hedges and we've had some interesting conversations over the years. And one of the things I find really interesting is that we have both been through traumatic experiences, him in war and me in, in I was gonna say the war against women and children, but you know, say whatever you want in, in domestic violence. And, and we took complementary and in some ways very different uh, lessons from it. But one of his lessons is, which I think is 
desperately important lesson is that um, he he has seen that basically acts of violence traumatize and can sometimes destroy people, and that he has seen too much uh, too many people destroyed by it. He's lost too many friends, and he doesn't like it and makes perfect sense to me. I, I don't disagree with that at all. At the same time, the perspective I bring, which he doesn't disagree with, is I learned early on that perpetrators of abuse, and this includes perpetrators of abuse against the planet, are insatiable. They, they, they can never get enough, which is one reason capitalism always has to expand. Um, there is no limit. And part of that comes from another writer who really influenced me very deeply was uh, R.D. Lang. Uh, unfortunately, he was personally a terrible person, but his, his writing is very interesting because he describes abuse perhaps better than anybody else I've ever known. And he himself was a perpetrator. Anyway, um, one of the things he said that I just loved is how do you plug a void plugging a void? And what I believe he meant by that was if you're using, let, let's say you have this profound loneliness, say, and this loneliness, uh, instead of dealing with it directly, you instead try to fill it with sugar or try to fill it with sex or try to fill it with uh, buying things. You're using another void to plug a void. And so, um, so you have to keep performing those same actions over and over because you're not getting, you're not, uh, you're not filling the hole that it's purporting to fill, which is why consumerism can never ultimately substitute for community, say. Okay, um, so we got some questions populating. Keep throwing your questions in chat. Um, we'll start with Margaret. Margaret, you had a question for Derek, if you can unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned coming back to what is, and I was curious what your personal process for that looks like. Well, I uh, thank you for that question. I can, I can go a couple directions with that. One of them is, um, is, you know, my, my father was extremely violent. Um, he broke my sister's arm. My brother has epilepsy from blows to the head. He raped my mother, my sister, and me. And I started therapy when I was 28 or 29. And I remember the first thing the therapist said is, I, I sat down and he said, so how do you feel right now? And I said, what? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and he said, well, uh, I'm sitting here and there's a window behind me and I feel the sun on my shoulders and that feels good. And you're a new client, so I'm a little bit nervous. And he just talked me through what he was doing. I was like, oh, I can do that. And so part part of it was, you know, simply uh, you know, one of the things that, that I did too much when I was an athlete, and I was proud of this as an athlete, but not so good in terms of being in your body, that, you know, I broke my foot playing football and I finished the game, and I broke my hand playing softball and finished the game, because I would just wall off the pain. And there are times when that could be life-saving, but a football game or a softball game, I don't think it's one of them. And, and so I was terribly out of my body. And, um, and that was a, so, 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 so in, in the long scale, what got me back into my body was 12 years of therapy and Lots of times of 
like of, of being in a not good relationship and going into the therapist and saying, so she did this and this, and she called me this and this, and she said I was this and this, and that doesn't feel very good. Uh, so am I wrong? Or was that inappropriate behavior? And so I hadn't learned how to do that. So, so the therapist helped me to, to, he would say, yeah, it's great, you know? It took you only four days to realize this was abusive behavior. And last time it took you three weeks. So that's great. And sometime you might be able to get there in a day. And then sometime you might be able to say in the moment, hey, that's not okay. So there was that. And then now, I mean, having gone through that longer process of I mean, this is such a buzzword these days, I don't really want to use it, of decolonization. I've gone through that process of, of um, sort of vomiting up the effects of a coercive upbringing. I, um, now, what I do to get back to it is, like when I'm writing, I will write some rhetorical thing that's all fancy and, and beautiful sounding, or as beautiful sounding as I can make it, and then I'll look at it and I'll go, but what's the real truth? It's like there's a friend of mine that I've edited his, his work for 20, 30 years now almost. And um, it's a joke between us that he'll read me something that he's working on. And then I'll say, huh, so what are you trying to say here? And then just forget the rhetoric, just what's real? And then he'll say, well, I think they're overcutting the forests of Washington. It's like, okay, we'll just say that. And I do the same thing all the time that I'll be, I'll be working myself in circles, trying to figure something out. And then I'll say, I'll just stop and say, okay, what is true? What do I know? And then I'll start, and then I'll just say, say that. And then I'll build up from there. So for me now, It's a process of, of trying to trying to ask myself, pretending that pretending pretending that I am two years old and being a very annoying or three years old and being a very annoying child asking why. So if I, if I say something, it's like, no, prove it, show that. And then why, why is that the case? And then go to the next level and then say, but, but why is that the case? And go to the next level and say, but why is that the case? And to sort of work my way back to what I know is real, kind of like, I mean, I end up in a completely different place, but kind of like, uh, you know, Descartes was looking for one thing he could trust and finally he came to, I am here. I, I am thinking, therefore I exist. And so it's the same, except once again, I end up in a completely different place, that I try to look for things that are solid and then build up for that. Oh, here's another way to say this, that I always had a terrible rote memory, which is why I did not do so well in organ organic chemistry or geology or mineralogy because a lot of that is memorizing nomenclature and stuff. Um, and so I've been always, when I got my degree in science and physics, I was terrible at memorizing uh, formula. And what I had to do in every test, which worked out pretty well for me, is it was much easier for me to go back to first principles every time and, uh, and re-derive the formula than it was for me to memorize the formula. And I'm not saying this, I'm not proud of the fact that, oh, well, it's great, I went back to first principles every time. It's simply because I didn't have a good enough memory to, to memorize the formula. So, so I do that in my life as much as I can. Let's go back to first principles and then build up from there, if that makes any sense. So it's both emotionally 
I had to learn how to get into my body and intellectually having a poor memory in some ways uh, and compensating, compensating for that caused me to uh, have to derive things from first principles. Cool. Um, so we had uh, two questions. Uh, I'll read one and then I'll take in someone to uh, say theirs. So Grace wanted me to read this on her behalf. Um, how do you have conversations with people unaware that they're caught in the dominant culture power over matrix? And this might be similar to uh, JJ's questions as well. So JJ, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello, Derek. Um, yeah, I've been listening to you and I just want to... I think you said something nice, but you also crapped out. Can you say it again? Sure. Um, I just said hello. And can you hear me now? Am I good? Yeah. Maybe yeah. turn off your video. Okay, I'll turn off my video. Let's see. All right. Um, so, yeah, I've been listening to your work for years um, as audio as I travel around London. And throughout, I've just wanted to kind of reach out and give you a big hug. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Oh, that's uh, awesome. And yeah, because a lot of what you said, I kind of resonated with. Um, a lot of kind of how kind of power kind of re reproduces itself and it reproduces in the actions we interpersonal actions we have within our families and stuff like that um, and so along those lines I'm curious on what ways you found to navigate your interpersonal relationships and um, kind of like how that relates to a wider community kind of approach um, community development um, cool thank you for your time and thanks for picking my question Peter well thank you both for those excellent questions and um, I think I'm not particularly proud of this but I think it, it, it reminds me of a question that I've gotten a few times which is um, when you, when I used to have family get togethers, which I don't really anymore now that my mom's dead, when I used to have family get togethers, what would we talk about at Thanksgiving? And the answer is usually football because I can't tell you how many Thanksgivings I ruined by talking about politics with people who weren't, uh, <laughs> who weren't uh, who were interested in having a big meal at all. So, so that's part of it. And then another part is, and both of these come from the fact that I think I'm fundamentally conflict avoidant. I don't really like conflict. So first off, I talk about football or something. And second, um, when I talk to somebody that I think there might be some sort of opening, I will talk about it in a way where I think that I can gain some access through a particular issue. So for example, uh, there was a guy at a local computer shop that I used to chat with him sometimes when I would go in to get my computer fixed. And <clears throat> he and I would not uh, talk about the death of the salmon because I knew he didn't care. On the other hand, we would talk about, I would raise the subject of how he feels about big box stores destroying local businesses because Walmart eventually drove him out of business. So if you, so I try to think tactically and find ways that we can raise issues that uh, that the person can think about over time. And here's another thing that really guides my interactions on those. I read somewhere that it takes 10 years to change your mind. And um, this guy was very strongly anti-choice on abortion. And then about 10 years later, he found himself very strongly pro-choice without having had any sort of discernible transition. And 
I realized that that's in many ways how I changed my mind too. That like when John Livingston first introduced me to the idea that nature is primarily based on cooperation, not primarily based on competition, I thought he was nuts. And I didn't say that to him. I just listened to him and thought, wow, he had some good things to say at one point, but now he's going over the edge. And it wasn't 10 years for me. It was about three years. About three years later, I could no longer conceptualize that, uh, that evolution is based primarily on competition. Sure, there are co elements of competition, but, but that's not the primary mo driver. And my point in bringing all that up is that I don't really argue with people. What I will do is I will make points, I will drop things in, and then I just walk away because very, 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 very rarely is someone in the moment convinced by argument. Instead, what will happen, and this happens, my friends, this happens so often that my friends are all used to it by now and they just laugh at me that my friend will tell me something, say, have, my friend will have this great idea. Oh, such and such and such about, you know, nature or something. I'll go, nah, that's not how it works. And then about eight months later, I'll go up to that same friend and I'll say, hey, I had this great idea. And I basically say the same thing back to them that they said to me eight months ago that I disagreed with. And my friends know this and my friends, so they don't argue with me in the moment either because they know eight months later, I'm going to come back and, and then when they remind me, you know, I said that to you, it's like, oh yeah, you did. Um, and I think that that's really how we learn is by having some idea challenged. And then I love the word rumination. Like, you know, it's like cows, you know, send the food down and then they bring it back up and they chew on it again and then they swallow it and then they bring it back up and chew on it. And I think that's how we really learn is by somebody says something, we go, huh. And then we send it down, we metabolize it for a while and then we bring it up and chew on it. And then we swallow it and we metabolize it for a while. And then eventually we have a brand new idea that is entirely ours alone, even though somebody said it to us a year ago. So, so I try to, I, I don't argue. I just, I can build a case, but then if I find there is a uh, strong resistance to it, great. Wow, that was a good game yesterday between the Nuggets and the Lakers. Really close. Man, I thought the Nuggets were going to win. Thanks. Thanks for that. <laughs> well, thanks for the question. All right. Uh, who's next? Do, 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 do. I think uh, Daniel Luckhart, if you can oh, ask it for him. Um, Derek, it has been many years since I've engaged in your work. Um, I know a lot of what you do is under radar by necessity, but if you could please speak about wedges, any wedges or levers uh, or well-placed monkey wrenches coronavirus responses have revealed or highlighted. Well, my work has to be all above ground. And so I'm actually very public about things. Um, oh gosh, maybe 15 years ago, I got a call from a defense attorney for one of the green scare people saying, I got an email from him saying, we need to talk. And I'm like, crap, that is the, that is the email you don't want to get from a defense attorney. So I called him up and he said, you need to be very careful because there are some prosecutors who really hate you. And I said, you know, there needs to be a firewall between above ground and below ground activities. And my job is to, is to discuss is to bring these issues into the open. So, you know, don't, don't really worry. It made him feel a lot better. Anyway, so that said, um, I think one of the things that makes very clear, well, a few things that makes very clear. One of them is that um, a decrease in economic activity is good for the world. And um, and, and also that the, and I've known this for a long time, but this just made this so clear. The, the global economic, the global, the global trade is incredibly vulnerable to all sorts of disruptions. 
And um, a great example having to do with the coronavirus is that I started following the whole thing back when it was still called the Wuhan virus, I think. Um, anyway, they shut down Wuhan and two days later, this, this is the moment I started following it. Is so, so I'd heard, yeah, 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 they just are shutting down Wuhan, that's interesting, but I don't know much about it. And then two days later, they closed a Hyundai factory in Korea, in South Korea. And I thought, wow, so a, shutting down a city, you know, thousands of miles away, caused this factory to shut down within two days. And the, I understood before then that the global economic system is incredibly inter, interdependent, which is one of the things, by the way, that really pisses me off, is that all sorts of economists understand that the global economic system is interdependent, but if you try to talk about the same interdependence in a forest, then they all of a sudden get really stupid and they can see that a, an earthquake in Japan is going to raise timber prices in the Pacific Northwest because it's going to mean an increase in demand for trees to build new houses in Japan. They understand that, but they don't understand that if you wipe out a certain species of frog, it's going to have cascading effects. And anyway, um, so I've read tons of history and I love reading history. And I was reading military history when I was literally in third and fourth grade. And it's become clear to me that wars are primarily won not by, as, as exciting and horrific as battles are, that's not really where wars are won. That the American Civil War was kind of won at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, but it was really one with a blockade. And it was really one in the industrial centers of, of the North as opposed to the South. And World War II, yeah, a lot of it was the Eastern Front. An awful lot of it was the Eastern Front. But um, the way you win a war is by destroying the enemy's capacity to wage war. And I think about this a lot. I, I, I don't, know about specific levers. I just know that the global economic system is incredibly interdependent. Um, it is, it has long supply lines which are vulnerable. Um, there has been a war declared against the natural world for at least the last 6,000 years. And if space aliens were doing to the planet what the dominant culture is doing, we would know exactly what to do. And we would go after the infrastructure. We would go after, we would destroy their capacity to wage war. But we get all confused because this way we get computers and we get access to ice cream 24 seven. And, you know, Lewis Mumford talked about that as the magnificent bribe. But why is it that we've all surrendered so easily to the modern authoritarians. And um, it's basically because they have collectively done a really smart thing, which is to make it so a significant portion of the people have a share of the goods and either that or a promise of the share of the goods. And so the American dream will keep people uh, Basically, so long as you continue to give me great health care, uh, ice cream, and somehow those two seem mixed, that if I eat enough ice cream, I'm going to need the health care, uh, and uh, car, computer, and uh, potato chips, and an electric blanket, it's like, I'm good. I don't need penguins. I don't need insects. I don't need a living ocean. And that's part of it. Anyway, so, so what we have to do 
is to, it's like, I think about this all the time. If salmon could take on human manifestation, what would they do? And if, so what I really want, and I, I left this off, I forgot about this earlier when I was summing my work. I think one of the things that we need to do that's really important is to transfer our loyalty away from the economic system and toward, uh, and toward the natural world. And then once you make your loyalty with the natural world, your, uh, your actions become more clear. And then, and then things become technical. Then it becomes, you know, how do you defeat the system? And, and at that point, we can really, as, as Leah Keith, who's here, as she says, um, we need to start thinking like military strategists. You know, we, we need to start looking at this as a war on the world and look at this, how do we win? How do we stop them? And I think it's a really, inter at the, I think it's important and I think it's also just a really interesting thing. Again, if we made a movie and they were space aliens who were doing all this, it would be a really exciting and fun movie how we figure out how to, to stop them. Um, but as it is, uh, we, we have mixed loyalties. Um, Ariel, uh, you had a question above. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, long time fan, Derek, thank you for this. Uh, I, I know you've gotten some criticism for, uh, your views on queer theory and third wave feminism. So I'd be curious if you'd like to speak a bit to how, how your views on those topics relate to your larger philosophy. Well, thank you for that question too. And, um, I think. Queer theory is just an extraordinary, well, a couple of things. One is queer theory is just an extraordinary thing because it's, there are some remarkable thought errors that are inherent in it that I'm horrified that uh, all these people in academia who, I mean, that's their job is to sit around and think and they don't seem to be doing such a great job. Um, and queer theory is based on the idea. Um, it is, uh, and this is their words, not mine. It is a total strike against anything that is normal. So it is, this is, this is their words that it, anything is normal is oppressive, that normality itself is oppressive. And some of the arguments will, and I've seen these arguments made many times, the arguments can boil down to, and they're especially interested in sex, and the arguments can boil down to, so strictures against homosexuality are clearly oppressive and wrong. Therefore, all strictures against all forms of sexuality are oppressive and wrong. And that just doesn't even pass like fifth grade logic. It's just, and I, I am not, this is not, this is not me being inflammatory. This is them making these arguments that therefore, because strictures against homosexuality are wrong, therefore strictures against pedophilia are wrong. Therefore strictures against bestiality are wrong. Therefore strictures against necrophilia are wrong. Those are, those, I'm not making those up. And it's, it's just crazy. And we can't really talk about that without talking about something else that's been really problematical. Oh my God, I, I hate that word problematical these days. That's another word that's been destroyed. Um, something else I don't like, let's just say that. Postmodernism. And it does the same thing. So I agree that strictures against homosexuality are wrong. I just don't agree with the next part. That therefore, and I'm going to back up even further than postmodernism. So there's, I wrote a book a few years ago that uh, 
it, it was about a struggle for the soul of anarchism. And this book cost me my publisher, two publishers actually, cost me seven stories in PM. Um, and in this book, I, uh, I argued that there are anarchists who believe that governments exist primarily to serve those in power. And this is a pretty easy case to make, and a lot of anarchists make this case, that governments, I totally agree with this, that if you just ask, do governments take better care of individuals or corporations? You know, I've asked 10,000 people that, and nobody has ever said they take better care of individuals. They take better care of corporations. So uh, corporations even exist. I mean, for God's sake, corporations are considered people. So, so on one hand, you have anarchists who believe that, that all that, that governments exist primarily to set up rules that benefit others of their class. Makes perfect sense to me. And on the other hand, you have anarchists who believe that because governments are set up primarily to serve governors and others of their class, therefore, all social rules are inherently oppressive. And that's nuts. And that's how you can get like the magazine Anarchy, a Journal of Desire Armed, dedicating an entire issue to promoting pedophilia. Because nobody can say, because all social restrictions are inherently oppressive. And again, I just think that's nuts. And unfortunately, there are a lot of anarchists going all the way back to Diogenes 2,500 years ago who, who believe that. So now let's move forward to postmodernism. The postmodernism was in some ways, and this is just a really short version of it, postmodernism is, was based on the idea that there are various uh, narratives that inform how we perceive the world. Absolutely brilliant. And some narratives get more attention paid to them than other narratives. And some narratives are pushed by those in power and absolutely brilliant, completely agree with that. That's why we hear how great Columbus was, but we don't hear that he was a slaver. You know, we don't hear all the horrible stuff. We didn't hear about it, you know, pre-1960 very much. <coughs> Excuse me. So postmodernism starts with the idea, we need to unpack some of those various narratives and see why some narratives are given more credence than others. Great idea. The problem is that their place they ended up is so ridiculous that it makes me question whether humans are in fact sentient. And the place they ended up is well, yeah, there are a lot of competing narratives. Therefore, there is nothing but narrative and there's no reality. Like what? How did you get there? And that's just as silly as the whole queer theory thing with just because strictures against homosexuality are wrong, all strictures against all forms of sexuality are wrong. Both of those forget that we have to come back to physical reality and that physical reality is primary and that there is, there are differences between adults and children. There are differences in cognitive ability. There are differences in ability to make rational decisions. When I was a kid, <laughs> and I don't know how any children survive. When I was a kid, I'd seen, I'd seen people jump off buildings in movies and I never noticed they did a jump cut in between. So the person jumps off the building and then somebody lands on the ground, but you don't see the part in the middle. And so I jumped off the roof um, and had a rude awakening when I landed on the ground. Um, fortunately, it was only a one story building. And so I just hit the ground hard and got an owie as opposed to breaking anything. But children do, oh, children, who am I kidding? In my teens, after I got a driver's license, it was really considered fun to drive down a country road and turn off your headlights and then drive through the night without headlights. What sort of idiotic person would do that? Well, a 16-year-old named Derek would do that. And the point is, children, children's brains are not developed. 
And so two adults uh, of the same sex having sex is not the same. Anyway, the point is that we always have to come back to physical reality. Physical reality is real. And then, um, and then you, you build up from there. One of the problems with the postmodernists is, you know, we, we really have a lot of cancel culture today. And part of the reason for that is that if you, if your primary argument, well, if you are arguing that reality doesn't exist and there are all these different stories, the only way you can win your argument is by, is by shutting the other people up. You can't use facts. You can no longer use facts if you don't believe that there are actual facts. That's a very interesting thing too. It really annoys me because I have made, those who've read my books, no, I've made some critiques of science. There are valid critiques to make of science, but the valid critiques don't include that it's not real at all. It's just one way of knowing in the world. The main critique I have of science is that it's not the only way, and there are things that are not reproducible, such as uh, willfulness. Um, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that if I drop this leaf, it's not going to fall to the ground. I mean, we still have the physical reality of, I mean, gravity still exists. And I always come back to that. Did that answer your question at all, Ariel? Yeah, totally. Thank you. All right. So we have about uh, seven minutes left. Uh, we'll, we'll sneak one more question in. Um, Anjan, you had a, a question. Hey, Derek. Um, I'm going to use a piece of jargon in my question, so feel free to punt back, and I can try my best to define it, though I feel I'll stumble. Uh, my question is, uh, what is your conception of what Moloch is? Um, what to you are the generator functions or the causal drivers behind it? Um, is the essence of environmentalism a fight against Moloch more than anything else? Um, I've heard the word Moloch, but I fear that it's primarily been in Vincent Price movies when I was a kid. So can you define Moloch, please? Is that the word you were thinking of? Yeah. Yeah, M-O-L-O-C-H. Oh, God, I'm going to stumble in this. Um, I think a, sh a, shitty, a shitty TLDR would be Moloch is kind of that beast. You could almost think of it as its own organism that has arisen to kind of swallow the world. It's kind of the game theoretical equilibria that is the system we put up multiplied by human nature, multiplied by beliefs or the stories that we're at that are behind securitization, financialization, corporatization, technologization. It's this consuming of the world, all the flows of the world into flows of value accretion, that money. Um, I think somebody said it really well, draining life energy for potential energy, which is what money is. Um, I don't know if that helps. Well, whether or not it helps is fucking brilliant. Uh, I love it. And I also just wanna say I mean, this is not angling for another invitation, but I want to say that your questions are all so great that I'd be glad to do this again sometime. Anyway, um, I mean, it's a huge question. And, and it, it, another way for me to try to define what my work has been about my whole life has been trying to find sort of, you know, a unified field theory for this culture's destructiveness. And a lot of it is patriarchy and patriarchy's violation imperative uh, that springs from and that inner sense of emptiness and you try to fill it and you try to fill your own brokenness by violating others and by pretending others are inferior to you and validating that in their inferiority by violating them and that's insatiable. And then we can also talk about, you know, Lewis Mumford's authoritarian techniques where the, the technologies actually get in charge. And that's a whole nother subject, but it's, I mean, are cities designed for human beings or for automobiles? And is the economy designed for human beings or for corporations or for the technologies? And the, the whole thing is run. I mean, it's so funny that they talk about the difficulty of getting off a fossil fuel economy 
or getting off an industrial economy, even though it's killing the planet, even though they acknowledge the harm it's doing, it's like, wow, who is really in charge? And, and then I have to bring in uh, Jack Forbes' book, Columbus and Other Cannibals, where he talks about what he calls, a, I don't know how to pronounce it, W-E-T-I-K-O, Wetigo, I guess we'll call it, Wetigo disease, uh, which he thinks, he thought, he's dead now, is a spiritual illness with a physical vector. And this spiritual illness causes people to uh, become vampires, to consume the souls of others. And it's a highly contagious disease. And, you know, we can talk about that. We can talk about the fact that agricultural societies inherently they convert the land base to humans put it to human use and that does two things one it causes them to harm the land base therefore their way of life has to be based on expansion at the same time it allows them to have more humans which means they get to have a soldier class which also means that they get to convert the land base into chariots of war, and therefore they have a competitive advantage over their neighbors. So we can talk about, you know, one bad apple spoiling the bunch that way. So we can talk about this in terms of sort of purely mechanistic material forces. We can talk about it in terms of, of sociological forces like Lewis Mumford does. We can talk about it in terms of a spiritual illness like Jack Forbes does. <clears throat> one of the reasons I wrote my book Dreams is because I wanted to just spend one book exploring the idea that there's like this cosmic war going on of, uh, I'm not sure I believe this, but, you know, like forces who wish the world ill and forces who wish the world well, and they're having a conflict. Like I said, different books are just exploring different facets of this. And I threw the ideas out in dreams. Maybe they're true. I want to see, I want to explore them to the end and see if they work. And I mean, what is Moloch? Uh, I mean, it's not. One thing I can tell you it's not is some people have written to me just very smugly and said, you know, Derek, you can ignore all your analysis because the problem is just greed. And I was like, well, Greed's a part of it, but what about a social system that rewards greed? Where does sociopathy fit in? It's like I did a talk years ago, 15, 20 years ago now, um, at Bioneers, and it broke my heart because Bioneers is supposed to be about social change, but I was the only person there who was talking about either power or psychopathology. And I don't know how you can talk about social change without talking about power, and I don't know how you can talk about the murder of the planet without talking about psychopathology. So where does psychopathology fit into all this? Um, and you'll note, by the way, and here I am doing the thing we talked about at the beginning, that I'm going to go ahead and attack myself instead of you attacking me. But you'll note I'm not actually answering your question. Um, I'm just throwing out all sorts of ideas because 26 books later, I don't have an answer. And I don't know that there is an answer. I think that there are a whole bunch of answers, some of which I've tried to list out. So before we go, how much time do we have, Peter? We are at the hour, but I'm cool to stay a little bit longer if you are. Um, so I want for, wait, who asked that last question? Anjan? So I want for you to answer what you think Moloch is. I think what most resonates for me is kind of, I think what you hinted at, this idea that we still convince ourselves that we're in control and that things are for our goals, but not realizing that we've birthed something. And you can think of technology also as us birthing um, a new form of life. And Moloch corporations as a super organism, and it's actually the one that's in charge. It's actually the one that's devouring the world, um, what exactly is it? Um, that's where this whole like game A, game B thing is, which is it's a set of norms and 
game theoretical structures, it's an equilibrium that maybe we could shift. But um, I'm trying to understand also the aspect that you're talking about, which is what is the human nature and sociopathy and so on. Well, so, thank you for all that. I think that's really great what you just said. And sociopaths have been in every society. And the question really is what you do with them. In, in some cultures, they would take them hunting and push them off ice flows. And in other cultures, they make them CEOs and, and leaders. And you know, I, I guess here's what I want to close with, which is Ruth Benedict talked about why some cultures are, to use her word, good and some are not so good. And um, what she found is that the good cultures recognize that humans are both selfish and social. And so they would destroy the bifurcation between selfishness and socialness by praising acts that benefited the group as a whole and disallowing acts that benefited the individual at the expense of the group. So if you do something that's really selfish, so I go out and I get a bunch of salmon and I try to sell them to people, then you shame me for doing so. If on the other hand, I go get a bunch of salmon and then I distribute them to everybody, then everybody says, wow, that's really great you did that. And you reward that, that socially beneficial behavior. And I can give everything away because I know tomorrow somebody else is going to go gather huckleberries and they're going to distribute those. So what we're building is social capital. And this is how healthy functioning families work. You know, at the dinner table, nobody says, Junior, will you pass the potato? And he says, yeah, that'll cost you $3. I mean, you do it because you're in relationships. Cool. The thing I love about this conversation is it manifests what we were talking about before about, I think, you know, I don't know if anybody's mind was changed on anything today, but it, uh, I think it gave, gave us all a lot, including me, to, uh, to ruminate on, to chew over. That's what the hanging out at the store is all about. Um, so thank you, uh, Derek, for coming to the store. We'd love to have you back um, and have a similar session like this, uh, maybe a more interactive dialogue uh, session. Okay. Uh, so uh, a couple, uh, I'll do some announcements. Um, uh, right after this, uh, after I press record, Ariel is going to lead like a post sense making conversation session. Um, she does something at the Stoa called the Dangerous Space on Sundays, where we can discuss dangerous ideas in a kind of a safe container. Uh, so we're going to discuss some of the stuff that came up here uh, today at 6:30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, Brett Weinstein is coming in to talk about Unity 2020. Uh, Raven Connolly is going to be uh, hosting that. That should be really fun. Uh, John Zerzan uh, is coming tomorrow uh, to do a talk on late stage civilization. That's at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. And we got so many freaking events coming up. Uh, Noam Chomsky is coming in November. You can check out um, the website right there. Uh, if you'd like to support us on Patreon, we've been um, doing free events, 400 free events since COVID started. If you'd like uh, to help us steal the culture and on the, while we sit on this digital porch, uh, feel free to support us there. That being said, Derek, thanks again, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. Thanks so much. Thanks for the great questions.